Hi Hans, can you hear us now? And also everyone else, can uh, you hear us? Can you see me? Can you see Ruben? Okay, brilliant. Sean says that we can be seen and we can be heard, so we begin. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world you're logging in from. Today we are going to discuss soil biology in the context of agriculture and water harvesting. It's a new topic, it's a new area of study, it's rapidly evolving. Uh, what has been established with a high degree of certainty is the important role that microorganisms play in maintaining and enhancing soil fertility and how soil moisture is key to sustaining this microbial life. Today we are going to discuss these ideas and go a bit beyond as we try to explore a bit the linkages between water harvesting and soil biology. We are lucky to have with us Ruben Borger, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, <laughs> who has uh, been exploring these linkages for a big part of his professional career. Ruben is the founder of Rock in Soils, Rock in Soils, or Rock in Soils, uh, an organization that researches and shares technologies to support healthy local food production systems and to regenerate the natural fertility of soils. So I would now like to hand over to Ruben, but before that, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this is the first in the series of webinars that will be organized uh, through a joint collaboration between the Water Channel, Rain Foundation, and the Rural Water Supply Network. And uh, for uh, more webinars and more discussions and more recordings of past webinars, I would encourage all of you to go to dgroups.org slash rwsn. I would also like to point out that uh, this is an interactive webinar. So I would like to encourage you to share your question and comments uh, through the chat window. And uh, uh, Ruben will either take them on during the presentation or at the end of the presentation, depending on if it's a burning question or if it's something that's best discussed at the end. So without further ado, I would like to, and also one more thing, I would like to request you, request all of you to please uh, leave starting now in the chat window, uh, your name, uh, the organization that you uh, uh, work for, and uh, the topics that you're interested in, the themes that you work on. Uh, it would be great if you could leave that so we get a sense of what kind of audience we are talking to. Uh, so thank you very much. And with that, mm -hmm. I would like to hand it over to Ruben. Ruben, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to stay here, to be able to, to talk to you. Uh, thank you to, uh, to the Rainwater Foundation, to all the partners for inviting me to uh, for this uh, to do this uh, this presentation it's an honor to me and uh, i hope uh, you enjoy the presentation and um, i hope you leave a lot of questions too so that uh, i also can learn from uh, from your questions and i hope uh, if i can i can show some uh, some uh, answers to to your interest um and this uh, this presentation is called the water harvesting and soil biology i would like to turn it uh, um uh, the other way around and to say soil biology uh, and, and water harvesting because I'm going to talk uh, mainly about soil biology and uh, most of that uh, because it's very extensive topic about the applications of uh, soil biology for uh, agri agricultural uh, agricultural purposes. I'm going to start with the first slide now. Uh, what I would call it is uh, an approach, my approach, the approach uh, we are using in the field to uh, regenerative uh, farming. A regenerative farming in the sense of uh, regenerating the agricultural uh, uh, resources that allow, uh, um, allow uh, harvest uh, crops to, uh, to evolve and to provide us with foods. Uh, the logical thinking here is to start working from the minerals and uh, to use microbes and mimic nature uh, to support living plants, crops, and, uh, and whole system uh, to create healthy food for us and to do it in a way that uh, we uh, ensure sustainable land use and to uh, even improve the conditions that our soils and our production uh, system is, uh, or our soils are happening. Let me see. 
Next one. I'm going to talk a bit about the concept of uh, living soils. This is not a new concept. I'm not going to use many new things. I'm just using uh, sometimes very old concepts to uh, to give them a twist and to, uh, to use them probably in a new way. Uh, I'm going to talk about the 3M framework. 3M, I like to call 3M uh, um, uh, framework, as I call it. That's microbiology, minerals, and organic matter. Uh, and then I will, I will talk about how, by understanding this 3M, we can biomimicry all these natural pro pro processes going in, uh, in, in normally in nature to uh, isolate these processes and uh, make them work for us in a very, uh, yeah, in a most efficient way. Um, and then I will talk about the translation that we do about this biotechnology to, uh, to smallholders and to um, subsist subsistence agriculture. I'd like to point uh, as a first concept the difference between what we, call, we could call dirt and soil, the difference between dirt and soil. Because normally when we are studying and when I study in the agricultural uh, school, uh, soil for us was uh, something that, uh, that was uh, a, a substrate and, and non-living substrate that was offering support for plants to develop and uh, supported also the solution of minerals uh, that would feed the plants. Well, this concept has evolved in, in my mind uh, uh, along uh, my work and my career into a, a, a bit more complex, uh, uh, co complex system, you know. I see this system as more a living thing. A soil, uh, different from dirt, is, uh, is a very complex uh, uh, system of living and non-living non things. Uh, uh, working together in a, in a way. There is no, for me, there is no strict division between, the, between uh, life and, and death. And, and um, the link between life and death would be the humus, the last, uh, the last level of the composition of the organic matter that would be. Uh, what we see is uh, uh, living soil, uh, we found them in nature, in forest or in natural systems, in a very productive systems, we found it and it's very alive. It's very alive. It's very full of millions of bacteria, millions of uh, fungi operating there in a complex network, what some people call it the soil food web. And uh, these, uh, these uh, communities of microbes are working there interrelated in a series of relationships, uh, sometimes helping each other, sometimes eating each other. Uh, and what they are very good at is dissolving actually uh, minerals and put them in this and in, in, uh, available for for the plants and, and the crops. What we see now is uh, in the last 60 years of uh, um, conventional agriculture is that uh, we have forgotten uh, or we didn't take care into account the concept of living soil. And we were feeding our plants with uh, chemicals, uh, chemical salts. And uh, basically, uh, we created an imbalance in, in the life of the soil. Actually, uh, um, the more the imbalance we see is uh, what we see now in the, the last uh, years is that the cost of production, they are increasing. And uh, with the cost of the production, the financial risk that the farmers are facing is, uh, is uh, bigger. Um, a soil that is fertile is a soil that has air, that has water, that has uh, living organisms inside the soil, and that has also a living organisms on top of the soil operating. When we go to an agricultural land, we barely see these things. We see no air because the soils are often compacted. We see no availability of minerals uh, ready, ready for, the, for the plants to be taking. And we hardly see any type of life symptoms in soils. That's, where something, that, that's something we are fighting back with, uh, with management, but also with uh, new types of inputs, organic inputs. This is not new, as uh, I repeat. These are uh, old concepts. Good. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to talk uh, 
when we're talking about organic farming, when we're talking about uh, managing living soils, I like to talk about these three um, words. This is not me, some colleagues in, in Latin America are using that uh, very often. Uh, the 3M stands for uh, minerals, microbiology, and organic matter. Uh, normally, uh, the, the, the third M, organic matter, must be an O, but I learned this concept from Spanish-speaking countries, so I kept it with the three Ms. What we see is that in soils, uh, the minerals are available for the plants, and there are different levels of, of minerals. Uh, uh, they are, they are uh, from rocks, from weathering, to uh, more uh, evolved minerals in form of uh, uh, and biological, and biological uh, um, compounds that they can pump, pass to the plants already, like enzymes, like uh, vitamins, like uh, proteins, like sugars. Uh, those are the type of, of minerals. So we have all these range from inorganic to organic uh, type of compounds. Microbiology is the engine that is turning uh, rocks into uh, more organic uh, organic forms, as we will see later. And organic matter is uh, is very important in the soil, as we all know, because it's uh, it's edible for the microbes, and it helps us housing and it provides a structure uh, to the soil when it's in a raw form. When it's in more decomposed form, it gives humus that is very important to create a structure in the soil and has many uh, chemical, physical, and biological properties to the soil. I will not enter now into this into this matter. Um, well, coming back, I was too fast with that. What we do is uh, we based our thinking in this uh, 3M concept to be able to uh, uh, think about agricultural inputs, uh, to think about uh, low-cost uh, solutions for the problems that agriculture and s small farmers are facing at this point. We see a lack of minerals in the soils, so then we, you are, we are using different types of rock dust. We are facing a lack of organic matter uh, in different types of, uh, of decomposition level. That's why we use fermentation of organic matter, like Bokashi type of uh, products, um, compost, and uh, different types of, of organic matter, as I said. We use liquid biofertilizers, like it could be like uh, like um, a fermentation, anaerobic fermentation uh, processes, uh, where we expose uh, minerals from rock dust and other types of minerals to the activity of microbes in order to dissolve that, to dissolve the minerals, to make them available for the plants. And also we offer types of management that they are very close to holistic management of agroecology. You must uh, have heard about that. The results we are finding in the field, we are working very much uh, in practical terms with, uh, with producers, with agricultural producers. Uh, we are seeing a, a general cost uh, uh, reduction in the, in the production of the, of the crops. And we are seeing that uh, the, the production is uh, maintaining or increasing uh, before, before the, uh, the other, other types of inputs were used, especially uh, conventional types of uh, inputs. And we are seeing also that the soil is really improving in the physical and chemical and biological uh, um, properties. Talking about minerals is that we, we find that uh, we normally, when we are talking in agricultural terms, we focus on uh, specific minerals that they uh, have a specific functions in plants. Um, the change here when we are working on low tech uh, uh, type of uh, agriculture and low inputs is that uh, we basically use local sources of minerals so from quarries and, 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 and from local uh, other local sources to uh, make uh, fertilizers. Uh, we see in this slide, uh, I did uh, with uh, together with Meta Meta, uh, um, uh, we did a series of visits to Ethiopia where we have uh, some uh, some uh, projects, and uh, um, one geologist uh, accompanied us uh, one time to uh, to assess the type of minerals we were having there. And we observe a lot of diversity in the minerals, the types of minerals. We look particularly for a broader spectrum type of volcanic uh, uh, minerals, 
because uh, we want to have a, a general remineralization of the soil in the right proportions. We found out that uh, um, uh, volcanic rocks, especially basalts uh, and uh, tough olivine, and they have a uh, good uh, diversity of minerals. We found out that the most uh, um, uh, fertile uh, systems are evolving in the young soils from volcanic uh, origins. That's why uh, we uh, infer, we think in that this uh, geodiversity, diversity in elements, in mineral elements, is, uh, is actually a good base for um, biodiversity and for productivity at the end. So we assess this, uh, these minerals and we try to, uh, to use them in, uh, in the local production systems. We go to the quarries. When we go to uh, one of the, our projects, we go to quarries. We go to different uh, to different places uh, to see what type of minerals they have, what are the, the access to for the local farmers, and then uh, we get them as uh, nature does. Nature is uh, using uh, heat and cold. Uh, nature is using uh, rainwater with uh, CO2 dissolve, you know, to uh, to attack chemically the rocks to do this weathering. Uh, we do also uh, in quarries, we make powder out of uh, stones and then we liberate all this amount of, uh, of minerals. We break down, we increase basically the surface of contacts when we have uh, stones in powder. And that helps us a lot when we want to expose uh, these minerals uh, to, uh, to biological activity. Uh, we can also use another type of minerals. We do not always need to go to the quarry. We can use minerals that they are already in the communities. Uh, we are using ashes. That uh, ash is very known uh, as a very good uh, potash uh, source. And we can also gain back uh, the phosphorus from bones or uh, use another type of minerals. So, so as we see here, we are in, in Tanzania and uh, in Ethiopia uh, doing this, uh, doing, uh, regaining actually uh, minerals from uh, from uh, uh, local resources and uh, what uh, or what they call it waste, but I don't want to call it waste. I want to call it some refuse so for some people, but it's very valuable. Also, minerals from the sea. Here we have a group of uh, colleagues in Spain uh, that uh, they are uh, taking uh, sea water and uh, they are making a precipitation uh, with uh, caustic soda. Uh, to uh, to gain uh, the minerals uh, that they are dissolved in the sea. We see again that uh, the sea, uh, except uh, uh, natrium, uh, the sea is a very good source of minerals in very wide range of, uh, of minerals, uh, of elements that we can get from there. So when we get a, um, when we get a, a technology that can uh, help us to get rid of uh, some elements we don't want to, uh, then we can use it and we have a very cheap and very uh, accessible for uh, uh, coastal areas of uh, sources of elements um, and this is this is something that uh, we are uh, we are I'm working in and we are working in uh, to to get a grip of the potential of the full potential of this type of technology there are already some commercial so commercial uh, uh, products based on uh, sea minerals and, and stuff and the stuff so so it's uh, uh, it's very interesting field of research going back to the 3m we went through the minerals already now we go through the organic matter we see organic matter everywhere especially in uh, in uh, rural areas and also in cities, we see a lot of mineral, a lot of organic matter that is left over. It's a waste. Normally, organic matter, when it's not treated, probably when it's accumulated in many places, uh, in one place, is uh, is becoming an hazard. We see organic matter as an hazard, and that's that's something that that uh, uh, is very uh, much damaging, uh, damaging the image of the organic matter. Because it's a very good resource for uh, for a farming and for for many other things. Lucky for us, uh, we are regaining regaining all this. Revalorization is the new uh, keyword at this point uh, uh, from from some years. 
to get you to 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 get back these uh, these precious uh, uh, um, resources and to the, put them back into the systems. Normally, uh, in the conventional agriculture, we find out that uh, organic matter is mixed with uh, other types of waste, uh, plastics, uh, chemicals, and stuff that make us very difficult to process, to pre-process, and to put them back into the system. So. Uh, we need to uh, to work more into uh, into this organic matter uh, management to be able to have a good resource, you know, because actually uh, it, I find it very crazy that our soils are more and more lacking, especially in the tropical areas, they are more and more lacking uh, organic matter. And uh, at the same time, we're wasting it. We are mixing it with chemicals and we are making it very difficult for ourselves to keep it clean and keep it usable for us. So that's, uh, that's something we're, we're working. We can work on organic matter. We don't need to uh, always uh, take it out from, uh, from the source and, and uh, transform it or add it something. We, we don't need to do that. Here we have um, in the upper uh, left area, we have a photo of a, of a, um, of a farm of macadamia nuts in Mexico that they are uh, collecting organic matter for, uh, for mulching. And they are fertilizing, fertilizing the actually the the weeds, you know, the, the, to collect uh, to collect organic matter, which is a type of margin that actually actually is not concentrating organic matter in any in any place. It's just dealing with that, leave it dispersed. Another uh, another type of use of organic matter is uh, well, uh, in uh, when we have a collection point and we need to get rid of that. Uh, at uh, greenhouses, for example, in, in Vietnam, in uh, flower farms, we get uh, we get a lot of uh, a lot of waste from from flowers. We get a lot of waste from uh, from uh, herbs and weeds, and we need to process them. Then we are talking about a typical type of composting. What we do here is actually we gain uh, we gain uh, microbiology from the soils, and uh, we use them to mix with minerals again. To, uh, to process this, to bring it to a balance and to, uh, to be able to manage a composting process. Uh, the same is happening everywhere in Ethiopia too. We have uh, flower farms. In Holland, we have uh, animal manure. Uh, there is a surplus in the northern areas uh, with manure. We don't know what to do with that. We don't know what to do. It's still a problem that we need to deal with. So, so this is uh, this is something we're learning about uh, how to um, how to mix uh, this uh, this organic matter uh, with microbiology with minerals to compensate uh, carbon nitrogen uh, 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 ratios and to create the best the best uh, compost uh, and, and the best uh, um, uh, fermentation process we can get uh, for the benefit of the local of the local communities. Uh, reproducing soil microbes is a uh, is a very trendy type of thing happening uh, happening in the last uh, in the last uh, years. There are many recipes in out there in the internet. Uh, we are using some uh, techniques that uh, that we're learning and we are working with them uh, for some uh, years. Actually, I learned these techniques from some people in uh, in South America, and Mexico, that they are working with these techniques for some years already. Um, um, reproducing soil microbes is is a very easy uh, very easy way to get uh, good uh, diverse uh, ma microbial groups uh, let's say uh, bacterial fungi uh, more, moreover uh, of uh, most li uh, mostly and then uh, and then be able to use them to uh, to um, change to ferment things to uh, transform things you know because one of the things microbiology is doing for us is uh, is uh, fixing some minerals, but it's also uh, solubilizing, solubilizing, like mobilizing some other minerals, is uh, decomposing organic matter, transforming. Uh, Microbes are very specialized in transforming these things. So as long as we can keep up these variables of, uh, of uh, moisture, air, temperature, pressure, and feed, you know, foods. Uh, we can we can selective uh, send the process into very specific uh, functions. So soil biology uh, is helping us a lot on this. 
and we will elaborate a little bit more on this. Soil microbes, so we use them here in a rice trap. Uh, um, we just cook some rice and we mix it with a little bit of molasses. Uh, and then uh, we expose uh, this uh, with, uh, we cover it with a small, uh, within a small uh, stuff, uh, stuff like this, wool fabric, wool fabric. And then, uh, and then we let the the natural uh, bacteria to come in, uh, in the in, to impregnate or to inoculate the rice. And then we see what type of communities are growing there. Then we can see it with our eyes. Here we have uh, samples of uh, two types of uh, crops of two two uh, two different uh, um, soils in uh, in apple trees. Uh, one apple tree was so in a very bad, uh, very bad uh, development. So it was sick uh, type of tree, and the other was a very healthy crop. So uh, we we were studying the the, the development of uh, of the, the soil, the, the the difference between soil life in one and another system. Um, normally, what we find out in the healthy systems, we find out a much more diverse type of uh, type of uh, communities living there. And in sick and uh, conventional production or farmers uh, farming, uh, we find out more uh, uh, less less diversity of biology living there. So this is uh, for us a very quick and dirty methods to use in developing countries, to use in places when we have no access to technology to see how is the system uh, performing. You know, if uh, if we have uh, if we have a good diversity down there, then we will have a very good system working. We brew also microbiology from the soil. We give them, we capture from natural forest where they are, uh, where they are living. Uh, we capture them. We give them sugars and proteins. Uh, we give them minerals so that they can reproduce. And here we have uh, this part. We have this part. Uh, um, uh, brewer, uh, homemade. Uh, they made. We, we made it there in, in Vietnam. Uh, to grow uh, our uh, soil uh, soil biology um, from the local forest and because the, we like very much to use local microbiology because this allows us uh, to use a very specific types of groups there. And, uh, normally when we use any microbiology we like to put names to everything but actually when we look at microbes we when we study microbes we only know like about three to seven percent of all the microbes then are in the soil. So I don't find it very entertaining to be a study only five percent of the soil. Um, I prefer to use the whole bra uh, to the whole spectrum, you know, even if I don't know what their name is and their function, a specific, a specific function, I can still go to the forest and catch and capture all of them or most of them and make them work for me, you know, so and they're still my friends. And so what I do is I go to the forest soil and I capture some soil and I put it in contact uh, with uh, some foods. I let them reproduce or ferment and some minerals. And then we use it to create our own inoculants for composts, uh, for compost teas, for, uh, to do chelates, uh, to do different types of, of, uh, of fertilizers, as, uh, as uh, we call it now. This is very important uh, for me. And uh, one of the things I want to, I want to point now because this is this was about rainwater harvesting right another application we are doing uh, with uh, with microbes uh, from uh, local systems is uh, we made this uh, this is more experimental level uh, we're still studying what is uh, going on but so we see that we mix uh, uh, soil microbes uh, with uh, with clay and uh, clay minerals and uh, and uh, with uh, some sugars and we make these balls and uh, when these balls we put it into ponds and places where the water uh, is being stored mostly rainwater uh, this rainwater uh, doesn't have any uh, uh, pres of uh, it doesn't have uh, much more presence of algae uh, uh, doesn't have much more uh, the, the pH levels go to a, to a more a seven uh, to a better uh, better point. Uh, we see these uh, these uh, as a very good uh, as a very good uh, 
uh, um, potential uh, technology that we can use to clean and to treat to, cle uh, to, cle to treat water. Um, basically, uh, the type of uh, the type of uh, materials we are using with this is uh, is basically uh, local. Uh, we don't uh, use any type of uh, any type of imported uh, inoculant or any type of imported powder or something. This is a technology that uh, that is uh, accessible for uh, any type of farmer in any type of uh, people. Uh, we see, uh, as you see here, the whole list of ingredients we mainly use is, is just water. We like to use ring water, I would like to say, because ring water is, uh, is a guarantee for us that it's not been treated or polluted with any type of things. Uh, so uh, rain water is working fantastic, uh, fantastically and we observe the best fermentation is happening when we are using rain water actu actually better than uh, river water or any type of uh, other storage water. Uh, we use earth, we use uh, molasses as sources of sugar, ashes as source of minerals, as you see uh, other sources of minerals are uh, rock dust, I wouldn't specify now what type of rocks because it depends on the soil, the plants, it depends on the local resources of rocks that we have. We like to use a mix of them to mix uh, to have a large diversity of minerals, as I said. We use charcoal too. We use charcoal too to provide housing for our bacteria and for our microbes and also to, uh, to provide with uh, uh, temperature, temperature regulator in the, in the soil later. And uh, we, um, we uh, at this point, I'd like to stop and to say uh, I attended to this uh, presentation of uh, last presentation on charcoal from uh, from this uh, from this water channel. Sai Bhaskar. Yeah, the, this uh, doctor was uh, was giving a presentation very interesting. So I learned. So I'd like to congratulate him uh, from this at this moment. Um, yeah, we're using that uh, too uh, in our processes, and we uh, we see that uh, that uh, the fermentation is, is going very good with that. I will show uh, as I will show now. Um, as sources of life, our sources of uh, biology, we're using forest soils, but there there are natural other natural inoculants like uh, cow dung, fresh cow dung, or straw, or uh, or uh, even we use uh, yeast as a starter too, like uh, baker's uh, yeast. So as you see that the idea here is not to make something very complicated, um, to um, make a, a product ready for, uh, for the next industry of uh, biological uh, fertilizers in the world. That's not the mission. That's not my mission. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is to simplify this technology, to put it into words that everybody can uh, everybody can explain, uh, each farmer, even with no previous studies, and that to make them able to to reproduce and to use these techniques. Uh, simple fermentation fermentation processes are already known in the story in every culture. There are thousands and thousands of fermentation processes, like making wine, beer, traditional cheeses, and all this, all this fermentation process. What we do here is we ferment uh, organic waste, organic refuses, uh, also to make food for our plants. That's that's another. Uh, that's that's all we we do. No no mystery. No no big thing. We make this uh, fermented organic matter, this bokashi, in different cultural, uh, cultural settings. Uh, I didn't observe any type of uh, problem by doing that. It's just going to a place and see what are the local refuses there, and then to try to compensate them with another, another materials to compensate the carbon nitrogen, and then to enrich with rock dust. And that's the difference I see. Uh, probably to inoculate with uh, high diversity inoculants again from uh, from uh, natural uh, natural forest or or um, yeah from natural forest or, or natural uh, places you know so that's that's basically what we do with uh, with composting um,
uh, we made also anaerobic uh, uh, fermentation uh, um, tanks. Uh, this is uh, this is very similar to what is being doing on uh, production of biogas. The difference we had used we are doing here is that we inoculate with local uh, local uh, local uh, biology. We enrich with minerals because the final product we need to we want to have is uh, is a liquid uh, mineral rich uh, solution in which uh, chelates are formed and uh, we can we can uh, achieve uh, uh, with this product we can we can uh, uh, focus on on fertility on on plants so uh, and also more like the production of biogas of these small systems is not really is not really high so we we're really directing here the fermentation towards the production of uh, of fertilizers you can scale this up. It's a technology that uh, you can use in jerry cans of 20 liters for demonstration purposes, as I did uh, in the last, uh, in the previous slide. Or you can do um, several thousands of liters here for, uh, in this case, for 70 hectares of macadamia uh, trees uh, with um, intercrop with banana and avocado in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, we see this technology as um, a very low input low tech uh, very easy and very appropriate uh, to preserve soil fertility while uh, fertilizing the fertilizing the the crops uh, yes and can be done by by anyone the approach is uh, i the approach i use when i go to to the projects is, is to create many uh, a, a network of uh, small uh, innovators of uh, small producers or um, supplying their own local markets because we see that uh, organic refuses and, uh, and uh, are very specific and because also we see that um, soil microbiology is very well adapted to a, a, a specific region a specific region so when everybody is using their local microbes that's the guarantee that this biology is going to be working once inoculated the soil that the soil will be working in, uh, in optimal conditions because this biology is adapted to that specific condition so that's why we are not thinking about uh, creating an, uh, an universal uh, universal inoculants that will transform our uh, stones in fertilizers and and then not doing anything else or not not installing itself in the soil I think we we'll want to lower down the level of dependency of the farmers by uh, by allowing them to make their own inoculants and make these inoculants very much uh, local and adapted to the local conditions. That's why uh, using the local resources is key. Uh, once we have production please, uh, local markets uh, working, and, and then we can we can think about uh, about uh, scaling up into a more global type of scale. Um, I like very much to work with uh, farmers and I like to work with organized farmers in the forms of cooperative, uh, cooperatives or uh, farmer unions because uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this type of organizations allow us to have a communication channel to be able to, to reach a lot of people at once and uh, to, uh, to have a community of practice already in the, in the in the operating you know in a relatively short term um, this type of um, approach i have is not uh, selling any type of product or uh, basing on import exports or is basing on uh, people making themselves their own inputs so creating networks of information and creating uh, uh, and, and using the existence uh, existent uh, networks of information i think is very much uh, empowering and very much um, very much uh, succeeding at this at this point. So we basically we uh, train uh, farmers that they are in the position to learn fast and communicate uh, with their uh, with their fellows, and uh, we uh, adapt the technology to the local uh, to the local uh, uh, to the local uh, conditions, but we see that technology should be adapted to the local conditions and not the local conditions should uh, should be adapted to the technology 
Uh, and we see that uh, that the early adopters uh, from this group, uh, a small, very small group of people, practitioners, that they are going to to implement it in their own farm. We coach them to make a small demonstration sites to um, to document the results and to be able to well to make a story to tell to their fellows. And then later, the the structure in place, the network will. Uh, take uh, sometimes uh, the responsibility to facilitate the process of communication and to develop uh, to develop strategies to to go for uh, upscaling, like uh, like learning, like uh, input of some supplies of difficult uh, if they are difficult to get. <laughs> so knowledge and skill is key for uh, for us to 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 work with. Where training is basically the main thing, because now we see the productive agriculture is based of the, the conventional agriculture has been based on the production of inputs, but it was never a technology that the farmers have owned. They never knew more than apply so much doses so many times per year and it will go right. Okay, now we are swifting to uh, to a different model of ownership of the knowledge towards the towards the farmers in which the farmers can really uh, become a little bit more managers and scientific uh, scientists in their own fields and they can really decide and manage what they are going to do how they are going to do and they manage their uh, the resource um, yeah i will go through a, a small uh, uh, list of, uh, of some experiences we have the last one was in ethiopia for coffee farmers we have there two uh, two project areas. Um, these uh, these uh, areas are uh, producing uh, coffee, organic coffee, and uh, we were uh, we were uh, coffees there producing uh, native uh, native uh, soil soil uh, forest uh, forest uh, soil, and we see that the quality of the coffee after plantation is uh, is uh, going down gradually. So uh, what we see is that uh, we are sta starting some tests with uh, local microbes uh, to to see if uh, if the, the quality of the coffee can can come back, you know, because we see degradation of the natural forest, the loss of diversity of plants, uh, and then uh, and then the quality of the coffee is also going down. So we see this relationship coming in every farm we go. Uh, so we want actually to restore the diversity uh, also not only in uh, at macro scale at plant scale but also in the micro microbiology scale to to be able to improve uh, improve quality so that's the test we are going to do we are doing now here another view of the farm i will go as now to this the approach is actually that the farmers understand this system understand the technology and the techniques to make it and that they are able to to produce their own inputs, their own farm inputs. And once they are able to produce them, they can test them in their own farms, in a small demonstration site at their farm, and to document it, to document if whether they, they failed in something or not. They are operating actually in communities of practice. And after that, after that, you see already that some of the of the people that they already seen the the beneficial uh, effects of this uh, of this te technology, they are starting to sell locally their own inputs. They are starting to offer consultancy services to their uh, to their neighbors, and they are starting an organic process of scaling up is happening at that point, and this is what we are after. That they don't depend on external external sources to scale up a project is organic growing. OK, I will go faster. Natural resources, as I said, this this photo is again uh, the use of earth, ash. So we go there, we go to a place and we assess the quality of the natural resources. We assess the quality of the water. We assess the quality of the manure and the rest of the, the rocks, the minerals, uh, the microbes. And then we just understand what is going on. We understand not only understand the physical part of the resources, but also the human capital, the, the, the ability of the people and the previous skills. And we give the training to be able to manage all these resources. Yeah, we are making uh, the, the first pile of, uh, of uh, fermented uh, organic matter. And a lot of focus on theory, as I said, 
and um, and after a few days we still uh, we start to see that biological activity in the fermentation process uh, while we are making all these preparations so we start to see in case of uh, of, of uh, bokashi the growth of micro uh, of uh, mycelium the growth of uh, of uh, different types of uh, bioindicators for uh, for uh, for soil life and that's what we are starting to see at, uh, at the at the at the or the organic matter we're dealing with. We also see increases in temperature here. We don't have always a thermometer with us in the local conditions sometimes, but we, we can assess the increase of temperature to a, a certain level. In uh, anaerobic fermentation, we assess the production of gas. So this is very important for, for uh, farmers to, to have a control about the process, these type of indicators. Monitoring soil analysis is very important too. We do uh, chemical profiles of uh, soil and also biological profiles of the soil to see whether uh, diversity of when well, scarcity of, uh, of uh, soil minerals are happening there. So we're, we are going with that. And of course, the use of, uh, of uh, microscopy is a very, very important. I cannot, I don't know if I have time to go through this a little bit more. As I said, we are making the rice traps. We are incubating uh, incubating uh, soil life to see what is the level of activity in uh, processing sugars or processing different types of uh, of uh, foods. Uh, and by doing that, they change uh, several parameters in the in the solution where they are working in the environment, like pH or redox. That's a technique called uh, bio uh, bioelectronics developed by Vincent, Professor Vincent. And France and Germany are now uh, very much operating with this type of uh, technology to have an holistic view on what is going on on the on, on, uh, the biological activity of, of uh, water and soil in solution with water. Microscopy to be able to to uh, see uh, bacterial and uh, fungal uh, development of the uh, of development and uh, biological profiles of DNA profiles. I think I leave it at this point. No. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, sorry for cutting short, but it's just that we've had uh, uh, lots of, of questions have come in, and uh, I think it uh, it's about that we absolutely need to start answering them. Okay. Yes. Um, so I will just pull up the questions on the screen, and. Uh, Sorry, please bear with me for one moment. So the first question is from uh, Shukru, um, who asks, why is rock dust not that widespread? Even though the benefits are good, it is cheap and easily reachable. And to that, I would like to add uh, the observations from another question, which is some of the soil additives that you mentioned, for example, rock dust, even though they are easy to manufacture and have all the advantages that you mentioned that they have, no. what keeps the supply chains from developing? Like uh, there are supply chains of chemical fertilizers reaching right up to the smallest farmers. Now, you mentioned that you would like farmers to be able to use local materials, uh, but uh, what I guess the question basically is what keeps uh, their use from becoming more and more widespread. I think, um, you know, from my from my point of view, what, what I see in the field in uh, the, the places I, I go, I've been operating in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Latin America so far, and I see that uh, lack of information is uh, one big thing. Lack of information is probably the most uh, the most important part. It, nothing keeps us using this type of local resources. There is uh, we can uh, we can talk about doom scenarios of, of uh, conspiracy theories that say it is forbidden. Of course, in some cases it is forbidden. There are some legal traps here and there or some legal barriers we need to to uh, to follow um, or to 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 you know get with <laughs> but um, i think mainly is uh, misinformation or the disinformation um, that's the mainly reason then uh, having said that i see that uh, 
um, there is attention, a problem of attention. We are our attention is going in in uh, in Europe is going to develop the market of biological products. So in this sense, uh, the use of rock dust in uh, northern countries is uh, increasing, uh, is booming at this moment. And there is a lot of also speculation with the different types of, uh, of rock dust that can be used with very specific uh, applications. I don't go into, into the detail of uh, that. Uh, but I think the, we don't need to miss the opportunity that give us the broad spectrum rocks to cope with big problems, you know. One third of Ethiopia is laying on basalt. We need to do something about that. Basalt is one of the best stones with the best chemical profiles we have. Let's go and do some analysis there and look what type of basalts we have uh, and uh, if we can use them, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know. Why is the supply not changing? The, the supply chain is looking very much into developing chemical fertilizer at this moment. It's a question of attention, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is from Robert Mehrman, who has two questions. One is, how important is rainwater harvesting in relation to soil biology? Mm. What role does it play? And also, um, he mentions you mentioning that fermentation is best when using rainwater. Uh, why is that? If you could explain that one more Yes, time. I think that rainwater harvesting, I even have a post on my website on rainwater harvesting. I think rainwater harvesting is uh, fantastic to, for, for me, is quality. If you want to have good quality, uh, you I go for rainwater always. Uh, for me, it's the guarantee that I don't get any chemical pollutants coming from uh, conventional farmers or from from some runoffs from some farms that they will kill my bacteria or it will create the conditions to lower the pH a little bit. To, will create the conditions to select certain groups and not the other. I want I want to have biodiversity and geodiversity. So that's why I put a lot of my, uh, microbes. And I put a lot of them, and to preserve all of, all of them, I need rainwater. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's the thing. And what is the uh, why is best uh, using? I think that does, that's the answer of the, the question. Rainwater uh, is uh, clean and pure, and I think uh, I think there is a misunderstanding in the general. In the, the common perception is that the groundwater is cleaner than rainwater. I don't think it's like that, and especially not in uh, polluted areas and suburban areas or uh, or intensive production systems like greenhouse uh, areas and all this stuff. We are having a lot of problems with uh, with pollutants, and uh, for me, it's just a guarantee. And rainwater is guarantee of uh, quality. A question from Asma is: uh, How could we manage soil, which is irrigated by untreated sewage water? And which contains, uh, which could contain very many antibiotics, which in turn affects the soil natural microbes or bacteria. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how can, how can we manage soil? Um, well, managing is a question of uh, deciding, you know, what to do, or not what to do. So, how can you manage soil that is being containing all these things? You know, uh, the first thing is to stop. Stop doing that. Stop putting antibiotics and all this stuff in the, uh, you know, in the, in the soil. You know, if you have a productive system, and stop doing that. You have, uh, you have systems to to do bioremediation, to do water treatment before they reach the soil. Uh, you cannot really manage the soil when you have this level, and uh, at some points the concentration is so high that. Uh, the level of, of remediation is, is not uh, not uh, reachable for a farmer. I, I, I infer that he's calling it a farming soil managed by a farmer that is already uh, polluted. I, I would say that's that's quite the challenge. That's not possible. So first, stop the cause. And second, uh, and second, uh, think about uh, a solution. Uh, Pre-treat waters before they reach the soil. Mm -hmm. Next question is how to deal with the unproductivity of land if we do not use chemical stuff. And here Edwin uh, mentions that many areas in Peru uh, without using <coughs> chemical inputs, uh, the benefits uh, are not very visible. Uh, well, I, I don't, um, how you say, um, I, I don't uh, see why do you don't see the, when you don't see the effects without putting chemicals, 
I, I see in all the cases when I was using organic fertilizers is uh, I see effects and I see effects in a very short term. So uh, uh, you can see effects without putting chemicals, that's for sure. That's for sure. Even if you have uh, in Peru in very high altitudes, probably and low <coughs> temperatures, you will have a different metabolism. You will, you will have different types of groups living there. Uh, still, still, you, uh, the the organic uh, organic fertilizers are working in uh, northern Europe and uh, high areas and cold uh, cold weather, not only in tropical areas. Also in cold weather in Spain at this moment, it's just working in Italy. It's working with very visible results. So I don't see, I don't know why we should study. Why you don't see the results of what are you doing? Uh, many things can go wrong in this, or, or many. It, it is. It is not a question about uh, the input. We focus always in the input, uh, and I hope with this presentation that it is not a matter of input only. It's a matter of management. It's a matter of management that is is. is key to success. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bad cough. <coughs> okay. Kirk Welch asks, uh, what are the best soil health strategies for improving organic content in large-scale commercial agriculture? Uh -huh. Well, as, as I said before, and I, um, I, I don't want to sound uh, hard on, on this, the, the best strategy is to stop killing soil. The live, as we see now, soil is a living part. If we start killing it by putting salts and creating osmotic uh, osmotic uh, uh, shocks, or putting uh, putting different types of uh, pesticides or herbicides, of uh, uh, we are impacting negatively on the soil health. That's that's for sure. By impacting negatively, we will uh, we will have uh, less decomposition of the organic matter, less humus. Um, worsening of the soil structure and all these parameters of the soil fertility that's that's by using by using chemicals so that's first step i would say that's the first strategy the second strategy is uh, using uh, using uh, chem uh, organic uh, organic in uh, inputs uh, from a local source especially in a large commercial agriculture where the cost can go up in a very easy way uh, I think every farm has to have a department of uh, of agricultural inputs, okay. and that's it. So put a department of people to produce their own their own food or plants. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have a very specific question, which is: uh, Could you please explain how cow dung is good for soil biology? How cow dung is good for soil biology? Well, cow dung is already uh, yeah, cow dung. I think uh, people from India can explain much more than me this part. You know, <laughs> they're using cow dung for uh, for uh, centuries uh, and with uh, uh, very good results on that. Uh, cow dung actually is mostly soil biology. It's not good. It's mostly soil biology. Uh, Cow dung is inoculated. I mean, the, the cow is a is, is a, a system that uh, has a mouth and uh, chews the the grass. Cow dung actually, the cow is not eating grass. The cow is eating the bodies of the bacteria that living in the system that they break down the cellulose and the sugars of the of the grass. Uh, the inoculation of the cow dung is getting from the from the grass itself, you know. So the the only thing that cows does is have a very nice environments to reproduce those bacteria and to grow them, to allow them to grow. And then they come back after fermentation, reproduction, and uh, some ab uh, being absorbed in the in the belly of the cow. Then they uh, anaerobically, I have to say, in this anaerobic part and facultative, of course. Uh, and then they go back to the soil, and then they go to, back to the soil after the fermentation, after they broke down and they liberated many minerals. So actually, cow dung is, is kind of good. The only thing is that it's mainly anaerobic and it's not directly usable for the soil, so it needs to be transformed. That's why in Europe we develop composting systems to avoid putting raw cow dung directly on the on the leaves of the plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question from Astride, 
is in the process of fermentation, water is required. Yes. And how is this process economical or feasible in a semi-arid or arid region where water is likely to be scarce? Um, yeah. Okay. Now, I think uh, the key here is, again, uh, rainwater harvesting. As does uh, first, uh, you can lower down the, the consumption of, uh, of um, water. Let me say, uh, fertilizing one hectare of crop, you can do it with 50 liters of water per year. You don't need more than that, okay. 50 liters of water per year. Uh, in a, uh, of course, you need to have it for the points. We're working in many areas, uh, arid areas in uh, in Ethiopia and in Tanzania, where water is not always there, and uh, we find uh, we find that uh, with limited limited amount of water, you can have you can have production of inputs uh, in a good uh, yeah in a good quantity. In the, I don't see it as a, as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from Shukru, who says that who. Uh, contends that for commercial agriculture, chemical fertilizer is crucial and they don't want to stop NPK application. I assume they as farmers. Can you so say that rock death dust is at least as good as NPK chemical fertilizers? And if we want to stop NPK fertilizers and start to use rock dust, what type of processes we need to follow up? Well, I think uh, we this in this question that is implicit, the fact that uh, Rock dust uh, is this is a substitute for the NPK application, and I don't think I want to say that uh, NPK uh, is um, mostly uh, three elements, and uh, rock dust uh, they are like above sixty uh, elements, depending on the rocks we are dealing with, uh, of course. But uh, we have a much wide range of the of the minerals there. When we use rock dust, uh, we are not supplying with uh, available nitrogen to, to the plant. So the working is, is different. Uh, actually, some people uh, using rock dust, they expect the plants to be green at the same at the same uh, uh, the same season in the, in the next week, and it's not like that. You know, like urium uh, is working like uh, like a, a green paint. You know. It's, you put, you apply it and you see it's green, so well you have an immediate effect on the, on that. The rock dust is not working like that. It's feeding is feeding from another way. Rock dust is allowing is allowing the soil life uh, to be able to fix nitrogen from atmosphere. We know that seventy two percent of the of the uh, nitrogen uh, of, of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Seventy two percent. Only twenty one is oxygen. Uh, so I think uh, nitrogen is not really a problem when we have a community that is fixing. I mean, forests are very productive systems, you know, the most uh, the most productive systems in terms of biomass, of course. And uh, I never saw anybody put in NPK or forest soil. Mm. So I think uh, it's at least as good. It's not comparable. Uh, NPK is not comparable. But when you say, let's talk about how many elements, chemical elements, we are adding when you, we put... Uh, uh, when we put rock dust and say, okay, MP3, well, you put three, uh, MPK, you put three. With rock dust, you put 50, 60 elements. So we are, we are getting somewhere. Staying on the topic of rock dust, Shukru has another question, um, which is, can we say that Leonardit, Leonardit, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. It's also a kind of rock dust. It is another type of rock dust. There are many types of rock dust, the more rich in uh, specific uh, minerals, but leonardit is another type of rock dust, yes, and it has also uh, physical properties and chemical properties, so yes, it is. And going back to the question is uh, if, uh, and if uh, we want to stop NPK fertilizers and start using rock dust, what type of processes do you need? Well, we need the process of fermentation. The plants do not eat, eat rock dust directly, and uh, rock dust need to be transformed into uh, bioavailable minerals. Actually, what we see is uh, there is a transformation. The plants, the research lab, I see uh, there is a video. It's called in the living soil. Mm. Uh, and this video, you, you can see that uh, the plants are exchanging sugars by minerals with uh, with bacteria. Actually, plants can 
can feed uh, feed bacteria and they attract to, to them by by producing sugars uh, to create this market this marketplace so yes we need a transformation for the rock dust in terms of fermentation to uh, to produce uh, food for the plant you know, to make them uh, to make these these elements uh, available for the plant uh, next up we have two questions that i would think are kind of related to each other the first one uh, you have already ad addressed um, at several points during your presentation but uh, i was wondering if you have something to add which is from Salah, uh, mm -hmm. who says how to replicate this apparently cost-heavy system economically to farming realities of smallholders. Scaling up, yes, but how? Then right. Mike Beresford uh, asks, uh, how does a subsistence farmer growing maize in Malawi, for example, have the know-how to understand how to get the right 3M recipe? Okay, so going first to the question of Salah. Uh, in all the cases, in all the cases uh, I was working with, when you start understanding where do the resources come from, um, farmers themselves they realize there is no apparently cost-heavy system. Uh, we achieve cost reduction up to eighty percent on this system just by using uh, just by using the local resources available so i don't i don't agree uh, on this cost uh, cost heavy system I, I don't think i don't think it is like that and from our experiences we see that i mean once you are working on decentralized systems because the biggest problem with this type of system if you want to create the centralized production system then you need to transport a lot of things in places like malawi for example or ethiopia where the infrastructure is not there that's why the oldest development of rocks uh, of uh, roads are going uh, and development of inf infrastructure are, are going to lower down the cost of transportation because of centralized production systems once we do decentralized systems at community level the cost goes to irrelevant so scaling up i explained it already it's just a transformation of technology uh, technology transfer and skill transfer learning by doing uh, farmer training centers is very important demonstration sites at, uh, at a very local level that's working and, and yeah mm -hmm. and going back to uh, going to the question of mike um yes uh, training is uh, is uh, important uh, is important uh, how to get uh, a farming uh, of uh, a farmer growing mice in malawi um, this farmer in Malawi needs to assess information. There are, uh, as I said, this is about creating communities of practice, is creating networks. <coughs> uh, I know I'm not selling products. I'm not selling something in a, in a, you know, in a bottle. In a bottle. I'm not selling in a bottle. I'm selling training, basically. Yes, but it is not. It is not my intention to be training every farmer. Of the world, so this farmer in Malawi uh, will need to be coupled to a network of people working on this, or community of practice working on this. Uh, there are already communities of uh, Tanzanians working on, on on this, you know, and and still learning, and they have some work to do. I don't see this is will happen from one year to another, but it will. We will get there. Mm -hmm. I hope. Well, with that, we seem to have reached the end of the question stream for now. Uh, if there are any further questions or comments, uh, Ruben can be contact, uh, contacted on rockinsoils at gmail.com. I've also put uh, the email ID in the chat window. So you can contact Ruben on that. Uh, for now, I would like to thank Ruben very much uh, for uh, uh, leading this webinar and uh, for his presentation and for answering all the questions. And I would like to thank all the audience for joining in and uh, for all their um, very thought-provoking questions. Um, I would like to mention that a recording of the webinar would be available on the Water Channel and also on the D groups of RWSN. That is dgroups.org slash RWSN. Uh, and uh, also on those uh, web pages would be information about future webinars and uh, also uh, a copy of uh, the presentation from this webinar would be uploaded would be uploaded
So uh, everyone, thanks again and see you at the next webinar.